Mesdames et messieurs, bonsoir, bienvenue au Club Suisse de la Presse. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to the Geneva Press Club. It is a real pleasure uh, to welcome you here in Geneva or online uh, for this special great talk. Uh, it is also an honor for me to welcome to you gentlemen coming especially from us from, uh, well, London, well, Scotland even. Uh, they, they were both trained as uh, brilliant physicians. One is a passionate book collector, the other worked uh, as a director of programs at WHO, World Health Organization, and they work now as co-authors. Dr. Stephen Slater, Dr. David uh, McFadden, thank you for being with us uh, today in Geneva. You're going to tell us tonight the story of two other great gentlemen, two artists, uh, Aloysius Derso and Emery Callan, also simply called Derso and uh, Callan. Their names count, uh, especially here in the Geneva Press Club, so close to the Place des Nations and its Palais des Nations. Uh, during three decades, uh, from the 19, uh, 1920s to the 1950s, they changed the view and the public opinion uh, and so many international and political events. Uh, they both witnessed and lived through so many ups and downs of 20th century history. Their names count in the history of cartooning, of art, of press, of freedom of expression too, and of course in the history of um, the League of Nations and emerging United Nations. Their names, their work count because we inherit now uh, the world they described uh, nearly a century ago with, with such wit, humor and insight. And uh, last but, least, but not least, I was so pleased to learn that there, Derso and Kellen, the two of them meet, uh, met in 1922 in my hometown of Lausanne. I want to, to warmly thank uh, Graces for choosing uh, the Geneva Press Club tonight for this special great talk. And I'm very pleased to give now the floor to Graces president, uh, Mr. Alejandro Bonilla Garcia. Alejandro. Voilà. Good evening, everyone. I am Alejandro Bonilla. I'm the president of Gray Cells, and I would like to welcome you to this really, as uh, Isabel mentioned, very special great talk. I would like to recognize Madame Sihal Sultanoglu, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, and Madame Charlotte de Senarclans, member of the board of Freedom Cartoon Foundation. We are very happy to have you here with us to, tonight. Dear girl friends, ladies and, and gentlemen, this is really very special for many things. The first one is the, the first great talk that we perform in collaboration with, uh, with a partner, in this case, the Swiss Press Club. We are extremely happy to, have this, to be building this partnership, not only for our great talks, but also and this is some new information, to, for our flagship activity, which is the intergenerational dialogue that will take place in this same room on the 25th of April on the future of United Nations. What is the role of Geneva in the UN 2.0? We're expecting to bring the voice of NGOs in Geneva to Nairobi in May, and then to New York and, and the summit of, of the future. So we are extremely happy to have this collaboration with the Club Suisse de, de la Presse. It is also really very special because this is the first time that our speakers prefer to travel overseas than speaking on, on Zoom. Thank you very much. That is really very generous from you and we're extremely happy to have you here with us. We thank your generosity your time, your traveling, spending here in Geneva, also your talent. When we got in touch for the first time, I thought that they were cartoonists themselves. And then they woke me and said, well, we're not cartoonists, we're, we're medical doctors, but we were interested in this. So they woke me through things, and, and it's really uh, hard work that they, that they did, did. And they are very generous also because they prepare for us two presentations that they will show in, in, in a few minutes time. So everything will be recorded and your bios will be 
put in, in, the, in the recording, but just for information, general information, I would like to introduce each one of you. Stefan Slatter, retired consultant physician in internal medicine, specializing in diabetes and endocrinology, MD with honors and fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, Glasgow, London, and Ireland, book collector for nearly 50 years, specializing in medical history and in illustrated material, especially the art, caricature, and cartoon of both world wars and political cartooning between the wars and the Belle Epoque. He has published in all these fields. David Matt Feidin, graduated in medicine at the University of Glasgow and completed postgraduate studies at the Universities of London and Harvard. Founded and led the WHO Global Program on Aging and before retiring, was director of programs in the Europe region of WHO. After retiring, he completed a doctoral thesis on the genealogy of WHO and UNICEF. In 2019, he authored the book, Eric Drummond and his Legacies, The League of Nations and the Beginnings of Global Governance, published in CHAM, Switzerland, by Paragraf Macmillan. It's really an honor and a privilege to have you here with us today, so I give the floor to both of you. I understand that it will be Stefan who start. Please, the floor is yours. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Alejandro, Madame Falconier, Manuela, ladies and gentlemen, and those of you who are with us online. It's a delight to be here, and thank you very much for inviting us. Now, with a bit of luck, whoops. There we go. Let me, let me begin uh, our talk with a, an overview of these two remarkable cartoonists, Alois Derso and Emery Kellen. This, our book, covers their life and times from the League of Nations hopes for peace in the 1920s to despair at the rise of fascism in the 30s and then hope again with the founding of the United Nations in 1945. It contains 100 memorable images, two-thirds in color. Few, if any, are likely to have been seen by present-day readers. Now, on the front cover there, you see the British Prime Minister, advocate of appeasement, Neville Chamberlain, Soon after the Munich Agreement in September 1938, is sacrificing Czechoslovakia. Sarcastically drawn, slaying the dragon of war with just his Englishman's rolled umbrella. Here they are in 1950. Derso left, Kellen right. Both were born in Hungary, Derso in 1888, Kellen in 1896. They served in its army in the First World War. Derso, a trained artist by then, ordered to find art items worth stealing from captured Italian churches, while Lieutenant Kellen won a medal at the Battle of Caporetto. Soon after the war, they emigrated Derso to Paris to work for Le Matin, Kellen to Munich to study art. Kellen says in this, his marvelous autobiography, I didn't know that Munich already had a struggling artist, Adolf Hitler. They first met in 1922 in Lausanne, where each was reporting on the post-war treaty conference between the Allies and Turkey, and began a very fruitful collaboration that would last almost 30 years. For over half that time, they lived here in Geneva, closely following the League and its personalities. We much admire their work for its political insight and foresight, its wit and gentle satire, its artistry and its historical value, and for their unique graphic technique. For they worked jointly 
one starting perhaps with the face of a politician and passing the picture between them until both were satisfied. For example, Kellen tells us that Derso was excellent at sketching postures and gestures, but that his hands and feet had a tendency to fly around, and it was his job to sew the body together. They've been called the Siamese twins of satire, cleverly portrayed in this caricature. Here are a few of their images. Le Paradis, from their 1931 portfolio, The Testament of Geneva, 10 years of international cooperation. It's a delightful, gently satirical picture of the League of Nations in a Garden of Eden war-free world. At the centre, Adam and Eve, two innocent international civil servants, work under the tree of knowledge, surrounded by an exotic menagerie of leading politicians and others, represented symbolically as big beasts and smaller creatures. They all appear to be on agreeable terms. But there's Mussolini, a prowling tiger, with his jackal-like foreign minister, Dino Grandi. Behind him, on your left, a line with flowing white mane, is Ramsay MacDonald, British Prime Minister, challenging shaggy-maned French Foreign Minister, the remarkable Aristide Briand. Near top right, is a black eagle, the German foreign minister, Julius Curtius, whom they've cleverly drawn, perched unstably on a prickly cactus, the Weimar Republic. Below him, next to Adam, is a small pale bear, Maxim Litvinov, the Russian people's chief commissar for foreign affairs. His ghostly appearance a likely allusion to the fact that Russia was not yet a member of the League, but a, an influence to be acknowledged. Overlooking them all, top left there is a large black eagle, Britain's Lord Robert Cecil, who, with US President Woodrow Wilson, was a prime mover in forming the League. Though, as you know, the US tragically didn't join it. All of the figures are named, a very unusual feature in cartoons, but most useful for future generations. Hitler, Stalin and Churchill will forever be recognised worldwide in caricature, but memories of the look of most polit politicians fade. Here from the same collection is Brion's Ark, an allegory of Noah's picturing the precariousness of the Locarno Treaties of 1925, which had appeared to guarantee peace, and for which the lead negotiators, the British, French, and German foreign ministers, Austin Chamberlain, Aristide Briand, and Gustave Stressman, had received the Nobel Peace Prize. Shaggy-haired Briand has sent off a dove of peace but the olive branch is being returned by a duck on canard. Clever symbolism. Another allegorical cartoon, The Promised Land, showing Briong, a latter-day Moses, leading his disciples, league statesmen and others, to a high mount from which he points to his vision in 1929 of a United States of Europe. This promised land, his peace concept, is insightfully given the appearance of a mirage and the idea faded with Brian's death three years later. Derso and Kellen produced illustrated menu cards for the annual international press lunches in Geneva and the pictures they drew influenced the speeches of attending politicians. David will give an example. In this one, in 1932, they seem to want to provoke the day's speaker 
into revealing something about the progress of the League's disarmament conference then. For they've drawn a puzzled journalist facing leading world statesmen depicted as enigmatic, inscrutable sphinxes saying nothing but sitting under a palm tree bearing strange fruit, bombs, its trunk encased in a large gun barrel, while pyramids of plans, proposals, and petitions for peace are being shoveled up. An ostrich with its head in the sand adds to the number of visual metaphors. The journalist is identified as Clan Street, then president of the Journalists Association and a staff correspondent of the New York Times. There's a close-up. All these menu cards were later collected in a bilingual portfolio of Banquet de Nation, the League at Lunch, and the original artwork hung in the Palais de Nation, still there. This cartoon, Please Replace the Turf, is from another bilingual portfolio. It shows the nations at golf at Onyx near here in 1932, shocked at the large mot de terre being hacked out by Japan's Yotaro Sugimura, League Under Secretary General. Its pieces fly towards the British Foreign Secretary, Sir John Simon, and US Secretary of State, Henry Stimson, who had sent a disapproving note to Japan for its invasion of Manchuria. La Motte is, by analogy, Manchuria. And Derso and Kellen sarcastically add, there in French, that members of the golf club shouldn't see any connection between its rule six about replacing the turf and Article 10 of the League Covenant that member states should respect each other's territorial integrity. Do you see where the golf ball has gone? It's heading for Secretary General Sir Eric Drummond's nose. This is the key message in a very clever cartoon that the League has been tested and found wanting. This, in contrast to the promised land, is the new Lilliput, published in May 1938, a picture no longer of hope, but of despair. Hitler lies sprawled across Europe, an untied down Gulliver, surrounded by Lilliputian European politicians, all of whose countries would, insightfully of Derso and Kellen, soon be overrun by him. Also insightfully, they portray Mussolini sitting on Hitler's finger as equally Lilliputian compared to him. Bottom right, in a top hat, Neville Chamberlain and his foreign secretary, Lord Halifax, stare haplessly at the contemptuously placed Sieg Heil on Hitler's boot. This was drawn in March, within days of the Anschluss, Hitler's annexation of Austria, the Danube in the background. Kellen wrote, those who had once believed in the League of Nations wandered its corridors like sick flies. And this striking image, boots, gloves, and refugees, more fine art than cartoon, represents the flood of refugees fleeing in terror before the blood-dripping boots of the Nazis. But restrained by governments, those white gloves there of consular authorities refusing sanctuary. And another in 1938 post-Munich minuet, everyone named, playing or dancing to the horse vessel lead, the Nazi party anthem. In other words, dancing to Hitler's tune. Hitler commandingly partners a fearful Edouard Daladier, the French premier, 
while Chamberlain bows obsequiously to Mussolini, trying to keep Italy on side. Lord Halifax glumly plays the cello, having second thoughts about appeasement, while top right, Litvinov sits alone, watching the charade, Russia sidelined. It's a skillful and most insightful tableau of the European political situation. Here's a brilliant, a brilliant cartoon of Chamberlain in June 1939, just three months before the war, still believing it could be averted or at least postponed. Look how well drawn is the doubt on the faces of the European nations under his protecting umbrella. Kellen, in his autobiography, provides an embittered pen picture of Chamberlain, which ends with, the umbrella will go down in history as a symbol of perfidious appeasement and its owner as a high-minded sucker. This, my last example, is Derso and Kellen's imaginative pre-war summing up. A mountain of treaties lie on a scale balanced against a small but highly explosive shell, while a mysterious hand floating in the air inscribes in Aramaic, Mane Takal Ufarsen, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Just as, biblically, it wrote on the wall of Belshazzar's palace, predicting the downfall of his dynasty, and now Europe's doom. Derso and Kellen followed the League more than any other cartoonists and showed its positive achievements, often forgotten or ignored. In late 1938, after 16 years here, they emigrated to the US to escape Hitler and focused on anti-Nazi images and later on the emergence of the United Nations, all of which we cover and illustrate. Their work featured widely in the European and then US print media, most notably in Ken, the remarkable short-lived 1938-39 US magazine from which those last few images come. Launched by Arnold Gingrich, editor of Esquire, it aimed to inform Americans of Europe's political disintegration, but was accused of warmongering, lost its advertising revenue, and folded. Derso and Kellen did not know Gingrich, and it's a sign of their reputation that he wrote to them from Chicago while they were still here in Geneva to work for him. Kellen went on to write, edit, and or illustrate 25 books, many about the UN. He became its TV director, winning an Emmy and other awards. Derso died in 1964, Kellen in 1978. And thanks to David's detective work, we've made contact with Kellen's daughter, Julia, in the US, and it's a thrill to know that she's here with us online. Thank you. Well, um, just looking at the audience tonight, I think you're all far too young ever to have been to the Brasserie Bavaria. But I can put my hand up and say that I have been to the Brasserie Bavaria, and it was there uh, almost half a century ago that I first saw the cartoons of Derso and Kellen. There were 150 in the walls of the Brasserie. And if you've seen there's a lot to take in in Derso and Helen cartoons, so I'll try to simplify it by just giving you a couple of descriptors. 
The first is tableau vivant. This is the term we use in the book um, to describe the style of Der Sören Kellen. This is La Tour de Babel, and they densely populate their cartoon with the caricatured individual whom they name. Here there are 272 from the League of Nations. A good number of them you see are crowded into the lower right, into the Bavaria. This was the gossiping place of the League, La Potinière of the League of Nations. Sorry, can you hear me all right? My next descriptor is gentle satire. Typically, Derso and Kellen caricatured their subjects with gentle satire, as seen in this detail of the warm-hearted and brilliant leader of ILO, Albert Thoma. Kellen tells us that when he died aged 54, the men and women of ILO wept bitterly. He added international civil servants tend by occupation to be skeptics, but I've got to admit that they know when to cry. On the other hand, we see unflattering images. On the ladder is Romanian delegate Ellen Vacarescu, whom the artist invariably depicted as ungainly, obese, with gaudy jewelry but this was untypical of them. The next descriptor is classical illusion. Would you put your hands up if you've ever been to the Bar de la Presse in the Palais des Nations? Well, you'll have seen there the menu cards of Derso and Kellen, much admired by our colleague Jean-Claude Pallas, who I think is online tonight, author of the magnificent book on the Palais des Nations, from which I quote here. The League bought this one for 350 Swiss francs. The finance officer of the time charged it to occupation of new building miscellaneous. It's one of several that allude to classical art, Jericho's Le Radeau de la Madouze, which hangs in the Louvre. We see League Secretary Eric Drummond sitting on the chest marked budget, defending it from attack with a pair of pistols. The next descriptor is historical evidence. A decade ago, John Burley and I, plus two other colleagues, began to research the life and work of Eric Drummond. This cartoon, drawn at the time Germany entered the League, was found among Sir Eric's private papers. We see him sitting on the left of German Foreign Minister Gustav Stressmann as guest of honour. This led us to discover that Drummond has spent long periods each year in Germany between the ages of 20 and 23. He would not gone to university, as many historians claimed. This is an example then of how cartoons serve to provide historical evidence. Can I ask you a question then? On what date did the Great War end? No, well, the answer is actually on this slide. And not as you expect, 1919, but the 24th of July, 1923. This was the date when the Treaty of Lausanne was signed, ending the war with Turkey. And um, our book was published in the centennial year of this important treaty, the Treaty of Lausanne. La Mesure Historique de Lausanne mounted a display of Derso and Kellen's cartoons for the centennial, but it didn't include this image. The scene is an apotheosis. The delegates are angels. And I would remind you of what Dag Hammarskjöld said, that the UN was not created to take us to heaven, but to stop us from descending into hell. Among the figures who appended signatures on the tablecloth is the American Ambassador Gru, the erect figure on the left of the table. Unfortunately for the cartoonist, he wasn't there. The significance of the US presence in the cartoon is evident from this detail of Angel Chester, who is gathering money from a cornucopia, a concession for a rail link 
to the oil fields of Iraq. Kell quipped that the conference was about oil that everybody wanted and refugees that nobody wanted. This image is from the Lausanne conference and it has shows chief delegate of Russia, Chicharin, firing a pistol and it was uncannily prophetic. His colleague Varowski on the right, an extreme on his uh, right, um, was killed and Ahrens with the tambourine to his left was wounded by Russian exile Moritz Konradi in May 1923. The surprise acquittal of the assailant fractured relations between Switzerland and the Soviet Union for many years. The woman um, uh, dancing the Hopak is the famous English journalist Claire Sheridan, um, who was correspondent to the New York World and quite a, a well known character. Derso and Kellen transmuted dull league proceedings into ingenious fancies, notably in Le Testament de Genève. This beautiful ribbon tied portfolio is a good humoured parody that covers events from the League's foundation in 1919 till 1931, and I think is the most impressive of Derson and Kellen's portfolios. It depicts the League's work in justice, finance, the protection of minorities, the reduction of trade barriers as seen here and the blowing down of customs walls. Peace and disarmament get scarcely a mention in Le Testament de Genève. Derso and Kellen menu cards, which uh, Stefan referred to, influenced the politicians of the day. And they sparked interesting and significant after dinner speeches, notably by the charismatic Aristide Briand. At the, uh, Briand, by the way, is the stoop figure speaking to the statue you see here. At the actual banquet, he picked up the menu card beaming with good humour and said, well, what do I see here? A tiny fellow making a desperate effort to be convincing to the fearsome god of war. And he drifted on in this amiable, good-humoured way till suddenly, with a sudden change of tone, he slammed the cartoon down on the table and said, they say I do nothing but bleat about peace. And then, in a breath's whisper said, till my dying day, I'll bleat about peace. This is the chef d'oeuvre, the masterpiece of Derson Killen, and it was the most difficult to source. The original work was acquired by the late Donald Stampley, who had a photography studio in Carouge. Donald photographed the work that you see and sold the original to a lady from Lausanne. Fortunately, Jean-Claude Pallas retained this large photograph he walked with it under his arm into the mairie in the town he lived in, Charente, and had it digitized. And if you're online, Jean-Claude, I would like to say a grand merci for doing this. Derso and Kellen honored the Michelangelo of cartoons, André Daumier. Daumier published a lithograph of the same name, um, La Sault de la Tribune, in 1849, when the established order in Europe was under assault. Dersu and Kellen's assault of the Tribune is an imaginative summation of the politics of 1936. It shows politicians climbing ladders, steps and ropes to be the first to reach the rostrum, some with ill intentions for the world like Goebbels on the top left. Here, in the bottom left corner, Mussolini and Hitler are dressed for war. Now the figures in this wear the centuries old costume you might have recognized these as those of the Escalade, and that put our artists in hot water. I don't think there's anyone here from the Tribune de Genève, so I can safely say that the editor got it seriously wrong in 1936. This cartoon did not decorate the bar of the League of Nations. 
Desso and Kellen produced the large canvas in lieu of bills for Madame Tonetti, proprietor of the pension in which they lived, and it was for display in the Hotel du Palais, which she managed. Ironically, the, new, the newspaper protested this advocacy of freedom of expression, claiming that it desecrated a glorious page of Geneva's history. Honour was satisfied by deleting the so-called Swiss cross on the chest of the person carrying the ladder. The United Nations sketchbook records multinational cooperation beginning anew with the commitment of nations through the UN Charter to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, and in equal rights of men and women. Here, Eleanor Roosevelt has the children reciting together, the rights of the individual are above the rights of the state. You see it more clearly in this screen here. The artists portray the Soviet delegate Andrzej Wyszynski in the naughty corner wearing a dunce's hat. Incredibly, Kellen published this while still working for the UN. Kellen's wife, Betty, concluded a memoir on Derson and Kellen with these very affectionate words, referring to her donation in 2002 of Derson and Kellen's entire collected works to Princeton University. And um, I should add Julie Kellen's name too, since Julie is online, as Stefan said. The watercolor on the left is from the Princeton collection. This is a wonderful example of Derso and Kellen's work. The trunk of the tree is the UN, with branches showing agencies which many of us worked. A significant detail is Trigvili's dousing of a cat and dog fight. This is a visual reference to the new power given to the Secretary General under Article 99 of the Charter. Why, you might ask, have Stephen and I immersed ourselves in the lives and work of these two cartoonists over the past years. For my, car for my part, this cartoon offers an explanation. Dr. Olaf Bunch is depicted removing spikes from a tree in Palestine. Hanging on the left of the canopy of the Stars of David, on the right, the crescent moons of the Arab world. Binet and weapons nourish the tree roots, while pastoralists from both communities go about their work in the distance. Both sides viewed Bunch as a friendly figure, and he established himself as an impartial mediator, bringing Israelis and Egyptians to the negotiating table on the island of Rhodes. He subsequently secured armistice agreements between Israel and four Arab states. Now let me set the scene. Gentlemen, you are in the Palais des Nations, you're in the delegates' dining room, and the PA comes to you and announces to you, you have just received the Nobel Prize. What would your reaction be? Well, this was Bunches. He was doubtful whether a member of the Secretariat should accept such an award and wrote a letter declining it on the grounds that peacekeeping at the UN was not done for prizes. For the last decade, I've had a curiosity about how collaboration between sovereign nations began and about how the UN came to be served by an international civil servants service that is independent and impartial, as so well exemplified by Ralph Bunch. Well, as John Burley wrote, this is where it all began. The foundation of today's global cooperation was that elusive aerial, l'Esprit de Genève. I thank you, and I leave you with Derson and Kellen's nostalgia for the Bavaria. If you want an entertaining account of multinational cooperation beginning anew in the early years, you'll find it in our book. Stefan and I are exceedingly grateful to the Press Club and to Grey Cells for giving us this, oppor this opportunity to present 
the work of two cartoonists who were themselves accredited journalists, and in the case of Kellen, also a former UN staff member. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, David. Maybe I'll oh, please uh, uh, join me here, both of you, so um, we can open the discussion with the audience here. Uh, would you have online any questions? Would you have here any comments or questions? And uh, I'll give you a few of the microphone so that we can uh, go on with discussion with David and Stefan. Thank you so much for the really interesting uh, uh, description of their work and life of Dershow and Kellen. So who'd like to start for a question or comment? <laughs> Do any of you recognize any? Uh, uh, yeah, okay, sir. So, so you can just maybe introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, thank you very much, Stefan and, and David, for this um, presentation. Um, David finished up on Ralph Bunch, which brings me to a question which may be a little unfair question. Um, but if you, knowing, uh, yeah, knowing uh, Delson and Kellen like you do, can you possibly imagine if he, if they were alive and cartooning uh, today, how they would present the current terrible conflict in Gaza? Um, what, how would they handle that from, from their perspective of trying to see all sides of the, the conflict? Thank you. Well, yes, only whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, please, uh, if you can use the microphone so that um, people online can hear you too. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I mentioned Article 99, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But first, let me say that Derso and Kellen would first and foremost said the important lesson from the days of the League was the importance of impartiality and being totally independent and impartial. I think that's the first thing they would have said, having seen how, that, how effective that was in the League. Article 99 gave the Secretary General power that the League Secretary General did not have. It gave the Secretary General the opportunity to call the Security Council, which the Secretary General just did in respect to Gaza. The other thing I would say is that uh, Kellen was very friendly with Raphael Lemkin, Raphael Lemkin was a man who termed the word genocide. And he, by during his league days even, tried to get genocide accepted as a, a part of international law. And after 1945, succeeded in doing that. And uh, Kellen described him like a hermit crab because he had no official position. He slept in people's offices in the UN and managed to do that. Uh, so, it has been brought before the International Court of Justice, which is the successor organisation of the PCIJ under the League. So, these are two immediate reflections I have. Um, but maybe Stephen would like to continue. Thank you, Stephen. Well, it's a, <coughs> it's a great question, John. How would they have visualised the current uh, hellishness in Gaza and Israel? And the answer is, I don't know. <coughs> but I can say, <coughs> I can say this. <coughs> One of the things that distinguishes them from probably most cartoonists, and I think David alluded to this, is that their cartoons tended to be fairly even-handed. They seldom appear to take sides. They really were trying to show that there could be collaboration. Now, there is one cartoon which uh, we know of, published in Ken, that US magazine, uh, which we chose not to show in our book. And this cartoon shows the three prophets. It shows uh, Moses pointing to the uh, Torah, uh, Muhammad pointing to the Koran, and Christ in the middle with thorns in his head looking impassively on at the scene. And all of these three prophets had claims to the land 
of then Palestine. And below, the scene they're looking at is the essentially the Arab rebellion. Um, it, it's, it is impossible to say. They were both Jewish, and uh, they certainly supported the founding of the State of Israel. But I rather suspect there would have been an element that showed that they could appreciate the problems on both sides. That's the best I can do, John. Don't ask another awkward question like that. Uh, Stefan and David, I'd be interested to know how your personal history with uh, Dersu and Kellen started, how you started collecting uh, Dersu and Kellen work, uh, how you started and why you started working uh, uh, on their work and ending with this beautiful and very interesting book. Okay, well, I've been, as you, as you said in the introduction, I've been co <coughs> collecting books for some 50 years, and I've been particularly interested, aside from the history of medicine, obviously, I've been particularly interested in illustrations and illustrators, and uh, especially in the, um, both the First and the Second World Wars and in political cartooning between the wars. So I've been at this for a long time. And when I first, purely by accident, some 15 years ago, was presented by a book dealer, many book dealers know my interest, with a lithograph that had been done by Derso and Kellen, I thought, my goodness, I didn't know about these guys. But they, they, I was struck by, particularly by their artistry. Uh, not for them, you know, a few strokes and, and with a black pencil. Uh, so I began to collect them. And uh, again, by chance, I first met David some four or five years ago at an annual arts, crafts, and collectors exhibition that I run at the Royal College of Physicians. And I learned that, that he, with you, John, and others, were uh, about to publish a book on the League of Nations. And he learned that I had Derso and Kellen material, for w at which he nearly fainted. So we then, a bit like Derso and Kellen, got together, uh, published, uh, presented a paper to one of the conferences on the League, published it, and then thought, well, why don't we write a book? Because no book had ever been written before. Very little has been written by Derso and Kellen, and uh, that's the reason why we got together and why we did what we did. Perfect. David, is there something you... Maybe I'd look uh, to uh, add to this story. Um, has anyone been to La Chatenere here? Anyone go to school at La Chatenere? Well, my son was a, a boarder at La Chatenere, and he was very unhappy there, and he ran away. And he ran away and stayed with a colleague uh, from ILO, um, Johanna Schregler, who was a director at ILO. And uh, I came back to Geneva. I had been posted to the Philippines. As, as you know. And um, I, I came back to Geneva and I took uh, the Schreglers out to lunch at the Bavaria. And there on the walls I said there were 150 caricatures of people from the League of Nations. It was a, just a wonderful treasure and I saw that for the very first time. What happened to those? Well, Stefan and I and John had lunch at what was the Bavaria today all the cartoons were purchased by Mr. Ivan Pictet and they are now in a collection that he has. Um, so uh, that my interest began a long time ago and then this incredible chance encounter I had with Stefan, probably the only person in the United Kingdom who could answer yes to the question, have you got any cartoons by Derso and Kellen? Could I just add a word that I say, I'm, uh, sorry, yes, Merit, sorry. Uh, just wait for the microphone. I, I, I'm also very impressed. You also wrote a book about Sir Eric Drummond. 
when did your interest start and how long t time did you use to gather all these materials? What was the how did we get all the material? Yeah, how long did it get you? Uh, how long did it get? Uh, did, did you uh, uh, did it need to for you to get the material together? I think that was the question. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> well, <coughs> I ha already had a lot of the material uh, in my collection. Uh, unfortunately, not the original artwork, if if only. But uh, just about all of the portfolios that they published, including the Testament of Geneva, which, as David says, a lovely item and a collector's item, and most, if not all of the book, virtually all of the books that Kaelin subsequently published. So that was one, one source. The other source was uh, at their archives at uh, the University of... Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you you had it, David. Yeah. Well, um, um, Marit Fossey, who asked the question, has it herself is familiar with the archives at the League of Nations, and um, they have a very very good archive of uh, Jerson and Kellen's cartoons there, quite apart from those that they purchased. Um, and I spent considerable time uh, at the Palais with the archives. Um, the most important source, as I mentioned, is Princeton University. There are 950 cartoons there and uh, they have all his writings also. And uh, uh, not only have we accessed that, but uh, we had an art advisor, and she went to Princeton University as well. Um, Julia, if you're online, we again, we'd like to thank you for that. Um, these were ready sources. Some of the others were more difficult to source. The PAX is at the University of Lausanne. Uh, if anyone knows, I know that you have a photograph. You're the only person that I know, apart from Jean-Claude Palas, who is the photograph of the masterwork. So guard it carefully. And um, uh, we had sources uh, for one of the first, second slide I showed of the Tour de Babel that came from the Library of Congress. But largely they came from published portfolios. And um, could I just say, Speaking to you today, it's very nice seeing you for the first time. I know we've corresponded, and there are other people whom I've also corresponded with who have come a long way to see us today. So, thank you all for that and for your friendship and support. I have a question this year, uh, Alejandro. Yes. Could, I, could I, Alejandro, just, just to add to that, Marit, I, I really should also acknowledge the book that you wrote with John Foss. Uh, illustrating the League of Nations, in, in, in which you had quite a number of Derso and Kellen material. Th thank you. This one is not working. Really, thank you very much for your for your presentation. It was to me. So I, I'm I'm a mathematician. I don't work in um, international relations, but it was an eye opener, and it was really very much a surprise when you shared with us the title of your presentation. It was satire in international relations, and is this are these international relations? Why didn't you just put Satire in war, and even more, to provoke a little bit more, satire in war in Europe, because the South is non-existent. The South is non-existent, so why did you choose international relations? We do mentoring in, at Gray Cells, and I'm sure that if the students that we mentor find out that this is what international relations is, they will, they will be scared. They will be doing possibly mathematics or something, something else. And I really was extremely happy to see the central stage that Geneva played in, in all of this. But why not war? Why not Europe? Because all the images were war in Europe. Yeah, so the, the question from uh, was about the Eurocentricity. Um, the first slide of uh, Le Testament de Genève, which showed the work of the League of Nations and, uh, for the first 10 years of existence, had um, 
showed that there was, I think, one person from the south there, and there was one woman there. So you're quite correct, the League of Nations tended to be Eurocentric. But Eric Drummond made every effort to make it universalist, to make it a universal organisation. International relations, sort of, well, a born, was born in a sense to out of the League of Nations and uh, the science and discipline really started from studies of the League of Nations. So um, we can only deal with the material that we had. They were very Eurocentric, they were Hungarians and the cartoons they provided were by and large of the big characters who were in um, Geneva or in around Geneva at that time. However, um, there are the Egypt, they, in their uh, very first um, uh, publication in Geneva, which was uh, uh, had a great number of caricatured individuals of the delegations and the staff. And the interesting thing was the large number of women who were on the staff because they showed the league as it actually was and as it was actually working. And also they showed quite a number of people from Thailand, from India and so on, who were, had played a prom prominent role in the, uh, in the functions of the Assembly and in the Council of the League. St Stefan, do you want to add something to you? Uh, I, well, I mean, we were asked to present our book and, uh, and this is what we've done. Um, so we've not, we've not looked at the whole global situation of international relations. We might do that next time. Yeah. Uh, may I ask you how famous were their Swin Kellogg during their lifetime? How popular, how well-known were they uh, during their work time? Well, it, it seems to us that they were very well-known. They were very widely um, they, represented in, in uh, European and US uh, press media, um, syndicated in the US, appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Post, various other important uh, publications. As I said myself, they were asked by someone who they didn't know from Adam to work for him while they were still in Geneva. Um, David Lowe, perhaps one of the premier cartoonists of the 20th century, well, I would say that because he comes from Britain, but um, he reckoned that their, that their cartoons, as he put it, were not mere sketches, but historical documents valuable for all time. It was also said that no conference, no international conference was complete until they put in an appearance to caricature the participants and so on. Um, so there's various other things I can't remember I would like to say, but they, they, they did seem to be well known at the time. I suppose one could ask the question, how many other cartoonists does one know of or remember from the 19th, uh, from the 20th century? And I'm not sure that we can remember many. They seem to just fall off the map. Uh, I think also, um, and uh, Julia Seckliner, who may be online, uh, made the point that, uh, first of all, emigrating from Hungary and then emigrating from Europe, they, the, there was really no one country that called them their own. And so they sort of slipped through the net, as it were. This may be why there's been no previous publication on them. Thank you. We have, I'll take a question online. Um, Tobias, you can maybe read, read the question for us. So one question from Chris Dai. He's asking, can you name other cartoonists that work in the spirit of Derzo and Kellen today? Can you repeat the question, please? Can you name other cartoonists that works in the spirit of uh, uh, Derzo and Kellen today? Yeah, can you name other cartoonists? Cartoonists that work in the yes, spirit that, of that work in the <coughs> to name other cartoonists today who work in the same spirit, spirit and way that Derso and Kellen did. Well, the short answer is no. I can't actually think of any cartoonists who quite engage in the rather novel pictorial journalism that they engaged in. 
So I can't. I may be missing somebody, in which case I apologize. David, do you want to add to that? Well, here in Geneva, of course, I would name Chapat. Well, he's well, not. I mean, it goes he doesn't, he doesn't. It doesn't work exactly in the same, yeah. you know, field or spirit. But well, well, it goes without saying, of course, Patrick Chapat. I know, I know of, but I'm not aware that he works quite in the same way as Derso and Kellen. Mm. Well, You'd like to add something? No, but, uh, we had just uh, before we, we started the evening. The one of the board members of the. Foundation, the Cartoon Freedom Foundation, Shapat's uh, Foundation, was here this evening, and we met with them the last time we were here. Very much admired Shapat, and they particularly admired what they are doing to protect cartoonists, because, in a sense, Derso and Kellen were fortunate, because uh, I give you one example when they got into trouble with the press, but what is very good about Freedom Cartoonist Foundation is that they've been very supportive of cartoonists who find it very difficult to be satirical about international relations today. And uh, so, unfortunately, she made her apology, she had to leave early. Um, and I know that Manuela made a great effort to try to get uh, Shepat to come this evening, but he is, as we speak, in Lausanne performing. If you want to go and see him there, you can inscribe and, and go and see him. But um, uh, but just as Stephen said, the, the, uh, there is no person, we, what we say in our book is that they embedded themselves in the League of Nations, that they were there, they were accredited journalists, they knew what the Secretariat was doing, and the important thing is that they, they characterised what the League of Nations was doing and what the United Nations was actually doing, and a lot of it was uh, showing how the staff uh, sort of were the glue that held the international organisations together. Thank you. Anyone else for uh, questions or comment? Okay. Yeah, here I am with the microphone. Yes, I was wondering now you've succeeded in writing this book. You have other projects? Well, nothing like what I've just done. It probably means nothing to many people, but my personal other project is to write a book about the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. <laughs> Hands up, anybody who has heard of it. Some at least, that's terrific. Thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, well, thank you very much. So, your book, uh, thank you for those, uh, of course, following us online. Uh, thank you for those here. The book is, of course, uh, um, uh, to be um, on, on sale, and you can have a lot of, of course, book signing. Uh, the book is uh, 30 Swiss francs, um, and uh, well, uh, we can go on and chatting about Derso Kellen, about International Geneva, about cartoonists, about maybe England too, uh, Europe, uh, here with some uh, empanadas. Thank you very much, uh, Grace, us for the great, great food tonight. Uh, um, thank you all, and um, Thank you so much, David and Stefan, for being with us tonight and telling about their Swan Kellen and their beautiful drawings. Thank you. Thank you.